Dead men walking, slave to sin. I want to know about being born again. I need you. Oh, God, I need you. So take me to the riverside. Take me on the baptized. I need you. Oh, God, I need you. Cause your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on like a sound of symphony to my ears Like a holy water on my skin Like a holy water on my skin Cause I don't want to abuse your grace God, I need it every day It's the only thing that ever really makes me God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. One more time. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Because your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like a sound. like a holy water, your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips, like the sound of symphony to my ears, like a holy water on my skin, like a holy water Like a holy water on my skin. Woo! Good stuff. Y'all can take a seat. Sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Come on. You got to get some of that, right? What I'm talking about, I mean, we're talking about a Sunday morning, some sweet, sweet honey on your lips, and that's just not in the song. That's actually going to happen today because we're having brunch after church and it's going to be sweet, sweet on our lips. Amen. Oh, come on. Come on. Sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Aren't some of y'all like salivating right now? Aren't you kind of like going, shut up, pastor. I want to eat. The longer you speak, the less time I get to eat. Right? Okay, so I'm going to move on. All right, so if you're with us this morning, maybe you're a guest or you're online and this is your first time with Anastasia Church Elkton, we want to get to know you. So would you please text ACE Connect to 904 441 6701? If you've got prayer requests, if there's something that God's doing in your life, if there's just something you have questions about, please let us know who you are. If you're watching online right now, uh, would you also in the comments just put Something in there like Jesus saves, Jesus loves you, and put sweet, sweet honey on my lips, send it to my house, right? Whatever, so we can just know that you're there so that we can also come alongside of you there on either Facebook or YouTube. So other than that, a couple of announcements. Yes, we have a brunch today after church, and it is Christmas season, so we've got a lot of things coming up. And one of those things is Christmas Eve. All on the chairs, all the way around you, we have this pamphlet that's called The Perfect Gift. Now, I know those of you who were here last week, you're like, yeah, you gave us one of those last week too. Guess what? You got more than one friend, or at least you better. So you got more than somebody else that works with you. You got somebody else that's on the other side of your house, another neighbor that, you know, instead of Fred, it's Susie Joe. whatever, right? Whoever it is, give this to somebody else. Take it, let them know that you would love for them to be a part of our Christmas Eve service. It's going to be here at the school. It's going to be on December 24th from 5 to 6 o'clock. We're going to have a cookie exchange. So all you bakers in the house go whoop, whoop. 
goodness gracious, this is a tough crowd today. They're like, it's because Miss Lil is speaking, so we don't want to hear you. Just move on, all right? Just, just move on, all right? So um, something else. Hey, guys, and uh, thank you, Chad, for reminding me about this. Um, all you guys that still have not gotten a Christmas gift for your wife, all right? Uh, we've got a suggestion for you. You know, I know it's, this isn't last minute. You know, a lot of us, we think about gifts being in a package that you wrap up. How about investing in your marriage in a way that says, you know what, honey, the best gift that we've got is one another. Amen. And so what we're going to do this year is we're going to be a part of Reengage, And Reengage is on Sunday nights at 6 o'clock. Um, we have two kind of, um, what do you call them, Chad? They're preview nights. So you don't have to make a commitment. You just go and check it out. It's at our State Road 16 Anastasia Church campus there on 16. And so 6 o'clock on Sunday nights on the 8th and the 15th. And you as a couple just go. We've had several couples that have been a part of this here at Anastasia. And it is a wonderful ministry where you invest in your family, you invest in your marriage, and just see God do some amazing things. All right, so that would be a great Christmas present for you to give to your wife this year. Just say, I'll make a commitment for 14, 16 weeks. 16 weeks to be a part of just loving Jesus and loving on you. All right. Um, Then uh, we want to just say amen. Thank you for being here today. Um, We would love for you to take one of these, give it to a guest. But we also want to remind ourselves that this is Christmas season. This is the Advent season, the coming of Christ. That he is coming and we are waiting and we are expecting for him to do wonderful things as we celebrate the birth of our Savior. So we want you to watch this video. And then we're going to have our Advent lighting. So let's watch this together. Coming from Luke, second chapter 10 and 11. And the angel said to the shepherd, fear not, for behold, I bring you news of great joy that will be for all people, all the people. For unto unto you is born this day in the city of David a a savior who is Christ the Lord. John 16, 22 and 24. So also you have sorrow now, but I see you, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Until now, you, will, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that joy. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. We bow your heads and pray with me. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we say thank you, Lord. Thank you for your son. Thank you for your son dying for us, Lord. And Father God, we, even the, with the pain that he endured, he did it through love for us. And Father God, we thank you that he died for us so that way we may live yet once more. So, Father God, we say thank you, God. Now to, now to God, who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all of time, and now, and forever. Amen. Amen. If you would please uh, stand with us as we continue to worship. He's ready to sing a Christmas song this morning. All right. This is a little, little fast beat, so uh, I hope you all had your coffee this morning.
And so, so there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Um, and oftentimes I just wander off the path and get lost. And it's just, um, it's God's grace and mercy that knowing that no matter where I'm at, where I've been, what I've done, that it's still chasing after me and um, it will find me again. So let's just sing through that verse four in the chorus one more time this morning. As the God of the mountain, as the God of the valley, and there's not a place mercy and grace will find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than One more time. Voices only this morning. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Love this praise team. It's good to see you back, Cheryl. Oops. Okay. First thing I want to do is dismiss the kids K through five that way. You've made it to kindergarten and haven't left the fifth grade, you belong out that way. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's good to see some new faces here. Good to see some faces back. Welcome back. Glad to have you here. I uh, want to pause now to thank everybody for coming. Thank everybody for this time of the season where we, we give. And we give freely through our heart and our love for one another and through our love for Jesus. And as we pause now to pray over our offering. I want to thank each of you for what you give and your time and your talent uh, to keep ACE working and to further God's work in this community and around the world. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we can gather together. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you freely. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to return to you a portion of the blessings that you have given to us in both our time, our talents, and the resources that you have provided for us, Lord. I pray that you'd bless all of these offerings that we give to you, Lord, that it may be used throughout this community and around the world to further your kingdom's work, Lord. I pray all these things in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being with us this morning. And we're going to continue our series called A Stable Influence. And I love this because this is the story of Christmas, right? This is a Christmas story. And uh, I think God has a sense of humor. Anybody else get that sometimes? You know, when you're in the middle of something and you, you come up with a, a title called A Stable Influence. And, uh, you know, your wife is going to come speak and then she breaks her toe. And she has, uh, you know, nice, a nice new, you know, shoe for her to show off there. She'll share a little bit more about that. Contrary to common belief, it's not because I did something stupid and she had to, <laughs> right? I mean, I do that all the time. Yes, I do that all the time, but she did not I did break not. it that way, right? I did Amen. Not. I did not. So, uh, but I just, I am so excited because as we walk through the Christmas story, and, and so many times we talk about Mary, so many times we talk about Elizabeth and all these wonderful women in scripture, but rarely do we ever get it from the perspective of a woman themselves. And let me tell you something, when it comes to my family, um, my wife is amazing. And I don't say that just because she's up here right now, um, but because I truly believe that God has given her as a gift to my family and as a way for me to know that God has a stable influence on my family, she's here today. And so I want to pray over my wife. I want to pray over us 
as we allow God's word to just be spoken into us and uh, through the voice of someone that not only has a master's degree um, from Liberty University and has gone through the training, has you know committed to ministry, has done so much along the way to minister to uh, not only women, but um, so many along the way, but minister to my heart as well. Amen. So let's pray together, and then I'm going to turn things over to her. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for being a stable influence on our lives. Thank you for my wife, Lilith. Lord, as she has uh, brought so much joy into my life, into my family's life. Lord, as she has shown us what it means to be a wonderful woman of God. Lord, I pray that you would allow your Holy Spirit to fill her now, that you would increase and that we would decrease, Lord Jesus. I pray that, Father, as we are inspired by your word, Lord, that it would transform us and that we wouldn't walk out of this place in the same way that we did when we came in. But, Lord God, that we would walk in the confidence of knowing that Jesus Christ is Lord. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Thanks, babe. Good morning, family. Yeah, I did not kick my husband. That's not how I broke my toe. Um, but I thank you for entrusting me with the word of God because it's been a crazy week. I broke my toe at work. I dropped a metal bar on it. Um, and I saw it coming, and all I could do was cringe my toes in. And I was so thrilled I didn't bust a toenail. I didn't stop to think that maybe I broke a bone. <laughs> so I did that. Um, and I also super glued my fingers together this week. Um, not once, but twice. I glued my fingers like this, and once I got that done, the next day I glued them to a, a metal piece that I was trying to fix. So the fact that Mason trusts me up here with the Word of God is a big... <laughs> I'll try not to fall down the stairs, but I can't guarantee that won't happen. Um, it's not how I envisioned spending my Christmas, starting my Christmas, and to be honest, um, Christmas is a tough season for me. It starts in, no in November. Um, Thanksgiving is always rough. It just reminds me of what I don't have. And sometimes you go into Christmas, and all I ever really, really want for Christmas is to um, go get a Christmas tree and bring it home, have some eggnog and chocolate chip cookies, and turn on a Charlie Brown jazz album. And I, that's all I want for Christmas. And I have yet to have it because all kinds of things happen around that season. Um, and we had some conversation with some friends earlier this week, and they had the same concept. Sometimes your expectations for the holidays are, are not. Um, you have ideas and you have plans, and then they're just not. And I think that happens in life in general. And the holidays can be a time when it makes you think about all the things that aren't. Um, so today we're just going to jump in and see what is. Fair game? Okay, so let's start. We're going to be in Luke chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, you're welcome to open them up, um, digitally or otherwise. And if you will stand with me, we're going to read um, what we call Mary's song. And it starts in verse 46. And here's what Mary has to say. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever more. Lord, thank you for this chance that you have given us to be together as a family, and thank you for this family that you have built. You built us on your word and on your son, on his blood and the seal of his Holy Spirit, and we just thank you for this. We ask God that this is your church, your family, your cafeteria. Just take over, speak what you want to speak, and let the hearts and ears receive. And we all say together, amen. Amen. All right, so what do we know of the Christmas story? Um, 
Anybody want to give a guess? First thing happens in the Christmas story is an angel come and vis- comes to visit whom? Oh, that is not where the story begins. The story begins with a priest named Zacharias and Elizabeth, right? So an angel comes and he tells Zechariah, dude, you're going to have a baby. And he's like, no way, we're too old. My wife is too advanced and graceful. See, I paid attention last week. Um, so the angel comes and he gives them news. And they're like, okay, we're going to have a baby. This baby is going to uh, be the preteller of what's going on um, in God's overwhelming redemption story. They're excited about that. So Zechariah's mouth gets shut. He can't speak, can't tell anybody about it. Elizabeth goes into seclusion because Elizabeth is old. And we need to remember some things about Elizabeth. Being old and being childless in the world that she lived in meant that you were cursed. The Lord doesn't give children to those who don't deserve them. And somehow this poor woman went her whole life feeling, I don't know what I did. So this angel comes and gives them great news and say this, your child is going to be the one that prepares our people to receive the Messiah. So they're in their little world. He's silent. She's in seclusion. And then the next part of the Christmas story is an angel comes and visits whom? Mary. Mary. Right. So the angel comes and he visits Mary and tells Mary, Mary, you're going to have a baby. This is going to be the savior to All the nations, all the people, it's great joy for everybody. And they're excited, she's excited, we're excited there's going to be a baby. And then what happens? Not sure, right? Where's Joseph? Joseph finds out Mary's going to have a baby. Does Joseph find out from the angel? No, he finds out by word of mouth. She just discovered to be pregnant. So then Joseph's freaking out. He's going to, oh my gosh, he's going to have a baby. We're not married. It's not my baby. And the angel comes and he says, hey, Joseph, don't worry. You're going to have a baby. Lots of babies going on everywhere. You're going to have a baby. It's going to be a baby that saves mankind, redeems mankind. It's from the Holy Spirit. Be graceful, okay? Well, that's what we know about the, the Christmas story. Um, but there's some things that we ought to know about the Christmas story, because for Mary to go into this thing that says, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices, we need to understand why she's saying that. So here's some things that we ought to know about our Christmas story. Mary was a young woman. Most of us know that, right? So in the Western world, we tend to think a young woman is 15, 16, um, and it's actually much younger than that. In culture back then, Jewish culture, a woman was betrothed long before she got her menstrual cycle. And that's to guarantee that she was a virgin. So when we say young, she was young. She was betrothed to this carpenter, Joseph. Um, And when we consider women in the day of Mary's time, um, oftentimes we have this picture that women are degraded creatures Women are property. They don't really have rights. But it wasn't always the case. Um, It wasn't the way that God had designed humanity, man and woman. That wasn't his intention. And for the longest time, you can read this in the Old Testament scriptures, there are women that held powerful positions. Ruth was able to influence. Deborah was a great judge. You had daughters that after the battle with um, Joshua coming into the promised land, that their father died in the battle. There were no sons, and they went up as daughters, and they, they made their case, a legal case, to get their rightful inheritance of the promised land. So there were places that we can see in Scripture where women had the ability to influence and had stature and had a place in the family of God. But something happens between Old Testament times and New Testament times. And there's a 400-year period of silence where God doesn't speak through any prophets. Well, we know what happens when there's a period of silence from God. Golden calves are created. People take what they think God says and they adapt them to their own. And this is what happens in that 400 period of silence. There are a lot of philosophers, Jewish uh, scribes, um, that interpret law and interpret the word of God. And things start to change for women. And one of those well-known philosophers and scribes is a gentleman by the name of Ben Syrah. And you can read some of his texts um, in Jewish literature, and there, it's, um, they do have some of his writings in um, other non canonical documents. 
But he doesn't have a very well-respected view of women. He was a Jewish scribe, lived around 200 B.C. Um, He knew Hebrew literature and ancient teachings. That's part of who he is. But he was also greatly influenced by Greek philosophy. He just liked to absorb knowledge and things. He liked to think about stuff. Um, And so sometimes he would take on these Greek ideologies and then incorporate them into Jewish literature. And so he had this idea that women um, were the, the, the ones that caused it all. Women were responsible for sin entering the world. Sometimes we still hear that. Um, we hear him say, be careful to keep record of the things you give your wife. Men, keep a tally of all the things. You, I keep a tally of the things I give Mason because he always says, well, that never happened. Yes, I did. Keep a tally. But um, Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Keep a tally of how much you feed your wife, how much it costs to keep her, how many... Um, things she takes out of the pantry so you can just inventory and this is the stuff that you need to take care of. I mean, track her, track her. He also says, if you give a daughter in marriage, then trouble will depart from you. Yep. Better is the wickedness of a man than the goodness of a woman. Better the wickedness of a man than the goodness of a woman. He so had this view of women that he took scripture and the story of creation and interpreted interpreted it to say that God made a mistake right from the beginning. He created the story that said God created man and woman, Adam, and his first wife, first wife. And it was so chaotic, and she was so determined to not be subversant to him that she ran away from creation and that God sent angels after her to correct her. And she so rebelled against God that they set her on a cliff and she gave birth to all the demons. And this is a story that transmitted orally and influenced the perspective of women's worth. Adam's first wife. God realized his mistake. He then creates a second wife, and we know her to be whom? Eve, right? Not so chaotic. They figured it out, and then, you know, they didn't do what God wanted them to do. They had their own opinions, and then the the world fell. Can you imagine to think that this is how you were created? The first, first wife of Adam is now the mother of all demons. And this is where Mary Mary sits. In a world that follows oral traditions and storytelling, where a woman is that, the mother of all demons. This is Mary, a young girl, a young girl influenced. Mary is also a Jewish woman. Now, when, we, when I, I, I'll say this for myself, when I read scripture, oftentimes I read a biblical story, and I will picture all the Jews huddled up in Jerusalem together, and it's them against the world. That's really how I picture it. I never stopped to think about what the world was happening, you know, what was going on around it. But at the time of Mary's existence, 80% of Jews, 80% of Jews did not live in Palestine. They lived outside of Palestine. They were in other nations. They were in Rome. They, were, they had been part of the exile. They didn't come back. They were established in their areas. So 80% of Jews were outside of Mary's area. So she was a minority in many, many ways, gender and in nationality. And I think that's really important to remember, um, side, side note, that when we have the Christmas story in mind, we often think of Mary and Joseph alone on a donkey, in the middle of a silent night, coming back to Bethlehem all by themselves. Okay, so it was a Roman decree by an emperor that said, everybody now needs to go back to their hometown, right? Everybody. So 80% of Jews that are everywhere else are now heading back into their homeland. So here's, here's a picture. Imagine 
the biggest hurricane happening and you're asking Floridians to get on I-95 and evacuate, right? That's what it looked like when Mary and Joseph were traveling. I-95, full of Floridians, trying to get out of a hurricane. So everybody's trying to come back in. So when you think about this Christmas story and you picture this silent night, it's not necessarily a quiet, silent night. There weren't a lot of roads. I mean, you couldn't take a side road here and go there. You, you really had to stay on the main road, right? And it was a very cumbersome road. There was no state troopers, no security, no 7-Eleven or gas stations. You just, it was, it was a hard trip. So this is Mary's world. This woman cursed, forsaken creature, Jewish, young, pregnant, frightened. You want to come up, Ron? You're doing a good job. I'm so proud of you. In her Jewish faith, there are four major um, sects. S-E-C-T-S. I know that's not going to transmit very well on video. Um, but four major divisions. So first of all, we have the zealots. And those are the ones that are, are preparing for a holy war. They're like, you pray constantly, you have your sword, you get ready for battle because we're going to tear down Rome. We, we're not quite out of our exile. This is what we're going to do. Then you have the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are kind of like um, YouTube influencers of the day. If you grew up in the 80s and 90s, you would say it was the Oprah of the day, but no offense to Oprah. Just the YouTuber influencers. So they were the, the ones that actually influenced the populations. But Pharisees had no political power. They didn't hold political office. And in the Pharisaical mind, they thought, okay, if you do all the laws... 613 of them that aren't necessarily out of scripture. There's a lot of oral laws that are, that are being transmitted and a lot of interpretive laws. But if you do all the laws, you're pure enough, you're good enough, the Christ is going to come through us, our little group, inside of our minority, inside of the big world. The Christ is going to come through us. He'll reset the world, we'll defeat Rome, and we'll be resurrected for them. That's the Pharisee mind. So you have the zealots who are like, hey, fight the holy war. You have the fairies who are like, hey, just be good enough. Then you have the Essenes. These are the ones that just like, oh, my gosh, I can't deal with society. And I just need to stay away from society. So they gather themselves up. They go outside the community. They don't want to be near government. They don't want to be near corruptions. If they can just stay good, at a, good enough, quiet enough, unseen enough, then God will come and do what he needs to do. And then you have the Sadducees. And the Sadducees are the ones that had political power. And they were the law makers. They were the scribes. They were the interpreters that interpreted the law to the people. It's really interesting. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Why would they? They had power. They didn't need a Messiah to come and fix stuff. So Ben Sarah, our nice little scribe, that didn't believe in resurrection, that had such a view of women, that held political power and influence. Can you see how the thought process now changed from Old Testament to New Testament? He had the ability to influence a lot. And oral law was really powerful then. Traditions passed orally. It was powerful to influence the people. And here's Mary, this young girl, young girl, promised in marriage in a community that doesn't have the majority of her ethnicity, in a world and a religion that's wrestling with her to say, hey, if you believe the way we believe, then God will redeem. Oh, if you do just what we said God said to do, God will redeem. And she's this wretched creature. My soul, my soul magnifies. My soul magnifies. I don't know that I would be able to magnify if I were her, my soul, my soul magnifies. This Jewish culture had um, rules that women had to live by. You couldn't travel on your own. And in fairness, I don't know as a woman I would want to travel alone in that world. The roads were full of bandits, um, robbers. There was no security. There was no pavement. You had to go 
down Galilee, around Samaria, up the hills of Judea to get where you were going. That was about a 100-mile trek if you're doing it the right way. If you cheated the system and went through Samaria, which no honorable Jew would do, you could probably knock about 30 miles out, but that's not what happens. You usually have to go around barefoot. You imagine yourself on a donkey. No donkey moves like that. Have you ever seen a donkey run? When you try, oh, they're on a donkey. No. You probably spend more time trying to get the donkey to move out than you get to where you want to go. This is, this is the world that she lives in. So Mary was a young woman. Mary was a young Jewish woman. Mary was a young Jewish woman from Nazareth. And Nazareth, nothing good comes from there. Nothing. Nazareth was part of Galilee. It was established um, after the fall. Priests went there, moved in there. In around 200 um, BC, the Maccabeans tried to Judaize it. Um, they wanted to create this religious nationalism. Gosh, we don't know what that feels like, right? If they could just make Galilee of the Gentiles Jewish, they could just kind of spur God's kingdom along. Like, we can, we can make God do something more outside of his timeline, right? So we can just spur him along. So this is Nazareth. Nobody liked Nazareth because, truthfully, it was a settler's town. It had no roots in the, the Israel, Israelites' story. There was no connection to it in Old Testament. There was nothing valuable because identity came from your history. And Nazareth had no history. She was a cursed creature with a religion that was so confusing, fighting for power just because you think you have a religious right, in a city that had no roots to God's promise. She's on the wrong side of the tracks. And she lives in a Greco-Roman world. And I've always read the Christmas story with the perspective of the Christmas story. God's doing through Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus. But we lose what she says when she says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in him. We lose it when we take her out of her world. In the Greco-Roman world, you had everybody come out of the exile. Egyptian, Egyptian captivity, they were there for 430 years. Then you had Israel had a civil war. Israel and Judah split. Then you had the Babylonian exile. That was 70 years. Persia takes over Babylon. Greece takes over Persia. There's another Jewish internal fight. The Hasmoneans are fighting for power. Rome comes along, takes everything. And from the Hasmoneans, they create these people called client kings, Herod. Technically, they're Jewish, but they're heavily influenced by Greek thought, Hellenism. Rome has the power. Greece has the influence. Rome has the rule and the sword. Greece has thought and religion and culture. And the one thing that we need to remember about that is there's a lot of syncretism happening. Your God is the same as my God. We just call them different names. Yahweh is Zeus. Same guy, different name. Your God is my God. Call him by a different name. Oh, you don't need to worry about Jesus. He's a great teacher. He's a prophet. Don't need to worry about his divinity. Same guy. I have a friend that lives on the boundary of um, Florida and Alabama. She's been living there for about five years. And one day we were talking on the phone and her vowel dragged. Hey, y'all. Your vowel drags. More Alabama. She was only there for five years. Sometimes you can go to another country and you can stay there and you can kind of pick up an accent after a couple years, right? You can hang out in a community and start to behave like your neighbors just a couple of years. Imagine hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of Greek, Roman, Babylon, Persian influence. And in, in that world, it wasn't just you went to church on Saturdays or Sundays. You woke up, you prayed to a god in your house. You walked out of your house, you participated in the god of the city. 
And that God of the city was part of a God, honored the God that was in a metropolis. Everything is incorporated. Trade has gods on their coins. Everything that you did had religion behind it. It was a belief system that made your existence center around something other than yourself. You were, you were influenced by that community, by that history. And that happens here too, right? We watch it in our nation. We have a lot of things going on in our nation. It's not necessarily what God's word says. But we watch people pick up a religion and run with it. I watch people take the sword of the spirit and use it for their own power. And it's really hard not to do the same. I can't separate my world, my influence from the world any more than Mary can. So she's a young woman, young Jewish woman from the wrong side of the tracks in a Greco-Roman world with hundreds and hundreds of years of saying there's no difference between your God and my God. And yet she says, my soul, my soul magnifies. My spirit rejoices. My soul. That word means the breath of life. The very breath of Mary's life. The very breath of her life magnifies God. And my spirit that word translates to her demeanor, everything that governs or influences her behavior. That governance, that influence takes over her body and it rejoices this cursed creature. And no value in a world that says she's responsible for it all. With a religion with so many rules against her existence that if she were ever to be found pregnant, they would drag her out and stone her publicly. And Joseph would be required to do it, to reestablish honor for him. My soul, my soul, my soul. I'd like to, um, I'd like you to just take a personal inventory as women and brothers, few sweet family members, just pause for a second and think about the women in your life. What does your world influence say about you? Are you climbing the ladder fast enough? Do you have children? Do you have enough children? Are you raising good children? Are you making a stand? Being loud enough? Making sure the world knows that you're here? You're not going to bend? Did you make a mistake? Worth stoning? Take inventory. And yet she sings, my soul, the very breath of my life magnifies the Lord. My whole disposition exudes joy in my Savior. So much joy that when Mary gets to Elizabeth's house, and remember, she can't travel by herself. She wouldn't travel by herself. The law would not allow it. She would have to travel a hundred miles, roughly, out of Galilee, around Samaria, up the mountains and hills of Judea to get to Elizabeth's house. It takes about a week on foot. If you did a donkey, he'd probably drag you another week out because I'm not a fan of donkeys. <laughs> but God can use one that's in the Bible, so if you want to check it, he can speak to a donkey. So she's traveling. She gets to, she's traveling for a couple reasons. One, the angel has told her a miracle has just happened. I've promised you a miracle. A miracle is going, has just happened to your, your elderly, advanced relative. So Mary has a few things going on. She needs to get out of town because Joseph has now found out that she's pregnant. Which means if Joseph knows, I'm sure other people in the city in her little town know, 
because they're expecting a wedding. And if Mary's gone and there's no wedding, did you know? Did you know Mary's not? She's not here. So Mary travels by grace. I feel like da- that. I feel that um, Joseph probably helped her get out of town. By grace, she probably had family members that traveled with her to keep her safe. She's traveling to see this beautiful miracle that's happened to an advanced woman who in society, in society would probably say that she was cursed by God because God never gave her children. She's going to go there to see this miracle. She's going to go there so that she has some time before she gets stoned. She's going to go there because she wants to help in that culture. She wants to help her family member have a baby. Women don't do it by themselves. Flashback to the Christmas story. Little quiet Mary all by herself having a baby would not happen. In that culture, it would not happen. Somebody would have been there. Women would have been there to to help her. So she runs, she goes, and she walks in the door, and she's like, Elizabeth! And Elizabeth's like, woo! And the baby in her belly is like, woo! And just the sound of her voice just makes all this joy happen in Elizabeth and Elizabeth's baby. Does your voice, just the sound of your voice, ladies, exude that kind of joy? Where you walk in and you're like, hey. And the world just stops for somebody. The influences around them stop because the kind of joy you have pushes that influence out. My soul magnifies God. My spirit rejoices in my Lord. What happened that Mary's voice did not quiver with one ounce of instability? Her whole world is rooted in instability. Her whole existence is rooted in in instability. What happened that Mary rejoiced so much that it changes Elizabeth? Luke 1, 46 through 49. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in my God, my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. When I was growing up, you would hear the Christmas story and you would hear this passage where it said that the Lord looked on her humble estate and just blessed her. And then you would hear um, the, the message say, she was so good. Mary was so good that God looked on her and decided, I'm going to bless you with my son. And she, maybe she was. I don't want to take any way, anything away from Mary. But I also don't want to take away her own words from her own mouth because she has a right to speak. So she says, for God has looked on the humble estate of his servant. And humble estate is a phrase that does not mean, man, she was so good. She was so pure. Oh, doesn't mean that. It means this. I'm going to say the word wrong, but this is how I phonetically wrote it. Taponosis, Okay. That's what the real word means. It means a lowness or depressed in rank, leading one to perceive and lament of his or her moral littleness or guilt. A lowness, a depressed in rank, leading one to perceive and lament of his or her moral littleness or guilt. Mary is so keenly aware of who she is in the world. I am a cursed creation. Responsible for it all. 
And if I make just one mistake, I'll be a stone flown my way. She was so aware. She might have been good and pure and as close to perfect. I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't know her personally. I'll ask her when I get to heaven. I need some clarity, Mary. Come have some, have a latte. But I don't think we ever need to take someone's words out of their mouth just because it creates a better picture for us. She was a woman of her time, and she knew it. She knew it. And she said, God saw me down here. And from now on, generations are going to call me blessed. That word doesn't mean, hey, she got a baby. That word means redeemed, to be pronounced redeemed. God looked on my humble lowliness that I'm so responsible for so much because the world says I'm responsible for so much. And God looked at that and he said, I am pronouncing you redeemed. I am picking you right back up. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you my son. My soul. Very breath of my existence magnifies God. Puts a a magnifying glass to it, puts it on the big screen, and it just shows who God is because he looked at me and he said, you are not what the world says you are. You are honored and established. I don't know how you walk 100 miles with morning sickness. A food shortage shortage in an empire that doesn't even like your people. And you walk that hundred miles knowing that you could have easily been chunked with a rock and say, I am a walking magnifying glass for who God is. This is not what the world says you are as a woman. (sighs) Who is this God who is not known by any other name that would do such a thing? Any other religion at that time you provided to this lower G God that you created And if it was a good enough offer, you got blessed. Um, The ladies and I were studying this semester on the book of Job, and we were talking about just compensation, just retribution. You get what you deserve. Just compensation means you're good enough, you get blessed. Just retribution means you're bad enough, you get punished. This is where the world is. And I'll tell you something, it's not that different in 2022. You can look at somebody's life and say, oop. I guarantee you they did something wrong because they don't have, they don't have, they don't have. And God is saying, "Mm mm-mm, they have me. Maybe they just don't know it yet. Who is this God? Luke 1, 26, 29, this is the God. Mary has already fled to Elizabeth. We know why. She wants to experience the miracle because she believed it. She also needs to get out of town, let the hot stuff cool down. And it's her culture to help your family out when they're having a baby. So she runs, she gets there. This is why. Luke 1, verse 26 through 29. In the sixth month, which is Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent to God, was sent from God, my apologies, to a city in Galilee named Nazareth. Good place, bad place. Bad, right? Why? It has no value in the story of God. So it was sent to Galilee, named um, a city in Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. 
And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But Mary was what? Greatly troubled, right? What does it say after she was greatly troubled? At the saying. She wasn't freaking out because there's an angel in front of her. <laughs> Which I don't know why it didn't freak anybody out. I would freak out. She wasn't freaking out because the angel was standing in front of her. She was freaking out because the angel said, Oh, favored one. And Mary, being keenly aware of her day, her time, and her standing, had no idea how to process that idea. When I was growing up and we would read this part of the story, I thought that meant she was one of his favorites. And oftentimes it's communicated as such. She's one of her favorites. She was pure. She was good. She was obedient. She fit this nice perfect image that we've created in our Christmas story. And then we set a standard that this is how we're supposed to be. I don't want to take away from Mary her own words. She's allowed to speak her own words. It's her story. God put it in there. And she says, I don't know what to do with that phrase. What the heck does that mean? Oh, favored one. Means to make graceful and lovely. And it means to honor you with a blessing. A cursed creation. Wrong side of the tracks. In a belief system that's ready to stone her. In the middle of a world dripping with gods that they say are all the same. And God says to her, oh, favorite one, I want to honor you. No, 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 no. I'm supposed to honor you, right? That's. That's the way it works. If I honor you good enough, well enough, strong enough, nope. This God, this God doesn't need you. He knows that you need him and that he loves you. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to look at your humble estate, and I'm going to redeem you. And all generations, all generations will call you blessed. Take a moment. What part of God's declaration over you are you greatly troubled by? That you're good enough? That you're loved enough? That you're purposed enough? And nothing in your world looks like that? What are you so greatly troubled by that this God that is not known by any other name would take a cursed creature and say, I'm going to do something special for you. Now, this is, this is the God of the universe, the Almighty. And if I'm going to give him praise today, I need to speak some truth. He could do anything that he wants to do. He could have sent his son in full glory, swept the world, be done with it. He could have done that. He could have used any other uterus. There was definitely a woman that was on the right side of the tracks, connected to Israel's history a little bit better, that probably was even good enough by pharisaical standards. He could have used a different uterus. He's God. He can do anything. Cursed creature, ready to be stoned from the wrong side. And he says, that's the one I'm going to go through. Because I love her. And I want her to understand. She understands so well 
what the world says she is, and I want her to understand who I made her to be. What part of God's declaration over you are you really struggling with, ladies? God, I struggle with a lot. He looks at Mary and he says to her, I have a gift for you. This beautiful baby, soft, warm, vulnerable, defenseless, and I am entrusting him to you to keep him alive to feed him, to shelter him, to teach him. I am entrusting you with my son, Jesus. And here's what I want you to know, oh sweet creation of mine. Look in the manger. Because all your instability is gone. You are on stable ground with me. You are on stable ground with me. My soul magnifies, magnifies this God. That is not like any other God. And my spirit just rejoices so much I can't contain it. Elizabeth had said, at the sound of Mary's voice, she had said, Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Blessed is she who believed that God would fulfill what he said to her. That's joy. Here's another young girl, young, born into a family that was a little upside down like Mary's world. Her father was an alcoholic, not the nicest guy, did some atrocious things, things that would make the world say he's embedded in evil and in hatred. Yet from him came the gift of creativity. And she was born to a mother, um, vibrant and and strong and wrestling with this world that she didn't fit into. And just trying to survive the brutality in which she lived. And she is filled with anger and depression. Barely just staying alive. But from her, this girl gets passion and strength. And this girl also has an advanced relative who survived World War II. And this advanced relative would would share these incredible stories about what God did. And so as this relative would recall stories, so did this young girl. She would she would just recall things went bad. And the relative would tell her the family that prays together stays together. So her mother would grab one little hand of hers and she would grab her siblings and they would pray after a drunken rage. When beatings would happen and lighter fluid was poured in eyes, people asking for matches. She would pray. Family that prays together stays together. And her family fell apart. How do you you make sense of that? This God that lets things happen. So this young girl just gets through life. Like Mary is part of her times. And at the tender age of 17, so scared of her shadow... 
a church member comes to her at youth night one night, one of her favorites, and comes to her, puts their arm around her and says, I did some research on your name. Did you know that it meant the mother of all demons? 17. And this girl was so terrified, so terrified that this is who she was, she went and told her mother, and her mother swore that she was going to take her down to the courthouse and change her name to Clara. No offense to Clara's. She was also dating this young man who used to sneak his Bible into her house. And on their dates, they would go on the beach, and he would share what he, notes he took from Scripture. And so she told him about this name that she had. And this guy said, you can change your name if you want to, but God knows you by name, and he loves you. And she wrestled with that because for two weeks, two solid weeks, she worked at a grocery store. In two weeks, every day, somebody would come in and read her name tag and say, pick up the back of your hair. I want to see if you have 666 on the back of your neck. Can you imagine this poor girl? Open your mouth. I want to see if your tongue is forked. 17 years, she had never heard this story. For two weeks following this revelation, this is what haunted her. So much so that she took her name tag off of work and she would wear her boyfriend's name tag. And when people would ask her, is that really your name? She would lie and say, yeah, my, my dad wanted a son. She was so embarrassed and so scared of who she was. But this guy... His boyfriend kept telling her, Jesus loves you. He knows you by name. He loves you. And she believed him. And they fell in love. And they got married. And she was wanted. She was safe. And then that fell apart. And she went back to her relative who was of age. And the relative would recount every time God showed up during World War II. And this young girl just had a hard time swallowing it. And then her relative got sick, and as she was taking care of her relative, um, she learned something about her life. Her mother, being in the tough situation that she was, when she found out she was pregnant with this little girl, wanted to abort her. In a world where it says she should have had the right. She should have the right. And this little girl just couldn't condemn her mom. Because her mom was scared and in a bad situation. And she couldn't condemn her dad for who he was, because she got all her talent from him, her love for crayons. She was a cursed creation, unwanted, no roots. Called by a name where people expected her tongue to be forked. Guaranteeing her that if he ever had a baby, it would be cursed. <laughs> and then God said her name, Lilith. Lilith. I have something for you. I have a baby for you. He's soft and he's small and he's defenseless and he's vulnerable and I 
trust you with them. I trust you open your arms and just take them in. You are on stable ground. Tell you something, I looked in that manger. I saw my dad as a baby. Soft, small, and vulnerable. He was somebody's little boy. And somebody did horrible things to him, and he grew up to do horrible things to other people. And he passed away on Christmas Eve a few years ago. And I look in that manger and I see my mom. And she is my grandmother's little girl. Who struggled living in a world where she just didn't fit in because she didn't want to cook and clean. She felt that there was something more for her and she just couldn't figure out what it was. She was somebody's little girl, and I looked in the major and I saw me. No other God would create in me the chance to bear his image. So when I look back at him and he says, I know who you are. I am a girl named Lilith. With no children barren belly with the only thing in my hand is a crayon and I have more kids because of that crayon than I will ever have through my own body. My soul, my soul just magnifies this God and my spirit rejoices in my Savior. You know why? Because Mary believed everything that God did in the past. Mary recalled everything that God did for those who feared him, who were in awe of him, who were overwhelmed by him. And I am so thankful. I had a grandmother who came through some atrocities, and she said, oh, you have no idea what God can do. This girl named Lilith, with a barren womb, Maybe this Christmas you're facing some things that um, <sighs> knocks the eggnog right off, takes away the Charlie Brown jazz. Maybe the one you love doesn't love you anymore. Maybe the ladder that you're trying to climb is so exhausting. You were never meant to build on the ladder. Maybe your ovaries are so shriveled, they make prunes look like fruit juice. Maybe you just, maybe you just. Maybe your health is fading and you think disease is winning and maybe you carry the title of a felon. That's all the world will see. Maybe you're a drug addict. And that next hit is the one that says, that's all you'll ever be. My child, my child, I love you so much. I have something for you. Open your arms. Take in this baby. He's here for you, and I trust you. Cafeteria floor is open. Doesn't look pretty like a church. Might be some raviolis over here, so be careful. 
But the floor is open if you just want to come and look in the manger. Your soul will rejoice. And man, if God can be magnified through a girl named Lilith and redeem her and redeem that name and have a purpose for you got cake. He can do it for you. Let's pray. As our praise team goes forward and how the Holy Spirit is moving in your life, whether it's coming forward or where you're at right now, or if you're online, we just want you to pray and to magnify the Lord, just as Mary does. We're getting ready to sing a song called Mary, Did You Know? And for us, what about you? What about my story becoming our story for God's glory. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. Lord, as we sing this song, Lord, as we give you all the glory, Lord God, for Mary's story, Lord, you have that same desire for me, myself, and I, for all of us in this room, for all that are hearing God's word, that Lord God, that we would be moved to a place of saying, my story becomes our story, God all for God's glory, that we would magnify the name of Jesus and that, Lord, we would give you everything. I surrender my life. Forgive me of my sin. Change me, God, so that I give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing. Let's magnify the Lord. Mary, did you know that your baby boy one day walked on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? It's you.
Amen. Thank you so much. We're so thankful to the Lord for not only uh, being with us here today through his word. Um, now y'all know what I deal with every day in my house, okay? I have an amazing wife, and that's just, I just want to thank my wife, Lilith, and just sharing God's word today, sharing her heart. But for each one of you, that you would know as well that this baby boy, this Jesus Christ, is so, he is the one that needs to be magnified. Amen? And that's what we do with our lives. We get to magnify him as well through good food right now. Amen? So we've got brunch for you. What we want to ask you to do is to walk out that door right there. You're going to go down the hallway, walk through, get your food, enjoy. We've got tables for you to enjoy that together, to have that meal together. And uh, we're just going to have a good meal together. Amen? So let's do that. Let's uh, go out that way and let's uh, enjoy this brunch together. Thank you. For those of you online, God bless you as well. Text Ace Connect to 904-441-6701. God bless you all. Bye-bye.